Yeah. Hi, this is. Yes. Perfect. Yes. Okay, just a quick disclaimer. Uh, there's no attorney client privilege. Uh, use a fake name. And then throughout this process, um, remember if you have a question, jump in as I'm asking. Highest education uh, completed? Some college. How many years? Uh, a few classes. What was the major in? She started in doctoral and then her health started going downhill. She dropped. Okay. Did she ever have a job thereafter um, in that particular field? No. Okay. Uh, so with her current age, uh, walk me through this. Uh, I, I'm assuming, uh, well, okay, let's do this first. What are her top three impairments? Thoracic outlet syndrome. Mm -hmm. She had a first rib resection mm -hmm. surgery in 2018, mm -hmm. which has been deemed a failure mm -hmm. as degenerative disc disease. Mm -hmm. migraines issues but mm -hmm. they have not been diagnosed because she has no insurance okay. or income she's living with me Okay. she has nerve damage um, she has little use of her right arm and hand mm -hmm. um, med limitations they won't give her the medicines she was getting before so that she can sleep mm -hmm. so there's times she'll go two weeks literally without it, with rare complications. And we have not been able to find doctors that are knowledgeable in treatment. And the surgeon that did her surgery left the state. The, the gentleman that is filling in is not willing to touch her and wants her to go from Florida to Minnesota. And she just saw a neurosurgeon and had new MRIs done and he did not agree with that at all. Okay. All right. This is a complex claim, but the one thing I didn't hear were a, a list of mental impairments as well. I'm guessing she's depressed. I'm guessing she has anxiety. I'm guessing she's unhappy because of all the dreams that she had that were kind of, you know, uh, slowed down. Let's put them that way. Can you walk me through this? How is she throughout the day? She has to spend most of it in bed um, at an angle because of the pain in her shoulder and her arm mm -hmm. and her neck. She will um, rotate into a recliner mm -hmm. and have to recline. Uh, she's not able to cook. Um, I have a disabled apartment and even with a shower chair and rails, I frequently have to shower her. Mm -hmm. She can't do laundry, cook. Um, we have a hearing coming up in one month, and we were just... All right. Um, it's being done by phone now. Aside from running questions with you, obviously you're doing this on behalf of your daughter. Um, and I know when it comes to mom claims, the mom's the one that's really running the show. So let me give you details you can go ahead and work on with this. I want to talk about trial tactics first and foremost. First and foremost, uh, because of that type of impairment, the limitations, her movement limitations, her walking into that room with some sort of, you know, crane, cane crutch walker, you know, brace, whatever, something that shows limited ambulation, something that shows limited upper bod uh, bodily uh, movement, we got to have that because the judge needs to see her walking into the room without the ability to do certain functional tasks. So the first thing I it's would do is, ball. well, yeah, Sorry. the first, yeah, no, I understand. The first thing I would do is go ahead and request that the that the um, hearing be rescheduled for an in-person hearing. And you're in Florida, right? Yeah. What part of Florida? Southwest. Southwest. Okay. So the bottom line here is, uh, I would go ahead and uh, reschedule it for an in-person hearing. You're going to have to wait four, five, six months to go ahead and have an in-person hearing. It's crucial, though. Make sure you do it. The next thing is, if you got an attorney that has two months of experience. Um, I would I would rather see you go with somebody who has experience. So is this a larger law firm or is this like a one person gig? No, it is a well known law firm. We already transferred once from one in Tampa because they were not doing anything. We were providing all the records. Mm -hmm. uh, we were begging for help, what kind of doctors to see, what kind of tests to have done, and we were getting no call, no direction. And so we flipped to this second law firm who's well known in my area. Mm -hmm. And um, it, it, we were assured that 
the initiator of the law firm would adjudicate her hearing, not adjudicate, but you know what I mean. Yeah. And um, we went in a um, month or so ago, and all of a sudden, we're getting flipped to this attorney who's six months out from the bar and had been doing criminal law and just switched to FSA. Well, that's scary. Um, all right. There's a lot of issues right. here. You got to switch attorneys to somebody who actually knows what they're doing. If that means staying with that law firm, fine. If that means switching to a different attorney, do it. Um, you only get this one shot at a hearing unless you get a remand after appeals counsel or federal district court. So this is, this is important. Now, the other thing is um, obviously medical background. You have an understanding of it. How do you know that you've actually obtained all the documentation? Because when we go in and claimants give me medical documentation, sometimes it's like daily updates and stuff like that. Sometimes it's the diagnostic impressions, medical imaging and analysis. So are you sure you have it all? We have obtained copies of everything from every doctor. They, she saw a pain management doctor for over 10 years. Mm -hmm. They're refusing to accept those records, only one year's worth, um, which I, I thought was important to show ongoing treatment, ongoing failure, all the, the shots, everything that she's gone through. Um, but who's, and who's refusing it? The, the attorneys are saying they will only go back to the date of disability. No, that's... That was that's totally incorrect. That is utterly terrible and incorrect. Um, you have to have as far back as you can get to show a longitudinal line. That's what's called in disability law, a longitudinal line of how the impairment started so that they can understand when it became severe. Otherwise, how are you going to choose when the impairment actually became severe? How are you going to, how are you going to figure out what your amended alleged onset date is going to be? You're not. Yeah. Right. So, no, that's absolutely incorrect. Um, that That is a major flaw. That is a massive flaw. You could potentially, I mean, look, if you're going to be only using a year's worth of medical records, imagine when the judge looks at this file, right? And the judge looks at it and he goes, okay, I only see about 400 pages of medical documentation. It's all very recent. Okay. What's going on with this? What if this just come out of nowhere? Major flaw. As opposed to the judge opening up the case file inside the ERE and looking at the F folder and saying, there's 3,000 pages of medical documentation. This goes back to 2010. This goes back to when she couldn't even do school. She had accommodations in school. I'm assuming you have the school records. Do you have the school records? No. Go get the school records. I want a letter uh, from one of the professors that she was working with explaining why she couldn't do things in class. I want a letter from two of her friends. She was depressed. She didn't care whether it was she couldn't go ahead and eat because of some stomach issue or an inability to go ahead and lift up a gallon of milk, whatever. I want a story from each family member that you can get explaining it. These are subjective evidence forms. However, they help tip it on gray area claims. There's another thing. What's worrying me about this? Um, <clears throat> You are okay. So, how far off is this hearing again? April fifteen, and they told us they told us that we are not allowed witnesses or letters to be submitted, which we found out differently on the internet. That's. I mean, this is like uh, because we're on live on YouTube. I'm not going to ask what the law firm is, but I just want to assure you. As somebody who had a hearing this morning, had multiple hearings throughout the week, that that's not how it works. If you absolutely need to have a third party witness, that's okay. In her particular case, because of all of her impairments, that would be acceptable. Another acceptable means of having a third party witness would be, for example, if a person has seizures, they get knocked out, they have grandma, they don't know what's going on. You bring in a third party witness to explain what's actually going on with them. There are examples where a third party witness would not be appropriate. Okay. Somebody's depressed and that's their only impairment. Somebody uh, has a physical limitation and they're fully cognizant of what's going on at all times. That is a limited situation where they're just going to want to hear the evidence about the particular you know, situation. Now, I will say this. Your daughter is probably not going to perform well when being questioned by the judge, which is why your attorney should be pushing quite heavily that the mother you be present or be allowed to come in during the hearing to give additional testimony. And this is what the judges will usually do. They'll remove the daughter, she'll go back to the waiting area, and then they'll pull in you to go ahead and give additional details. What other unique things is this law firm telling you? 
Um, what else, Chris? Do you want to take a... I am the, I'm the daughter of the claimant. Um, Howdy, madam. Because of, okay, because of the pain and exhaustion, I, um, I get incoherent slur in my speech, things like that, which is why my mom's been helping me. Um, the attorney, when we were questioning them about the new person, they basically went off screaming at us, calling us liars, all kinds of lovely things. And at one point, I had a neighbor that when I moved into an apartment, I'd never met him before until I moved there. He was coming over every single day, helping me, bringing groceries, taking the trash out, um, bringing me food, things like that. He, um, he's the one that found me several times unconscious on the floor, and he'd be calling my mom panicked. What do I do? How do I help her? Mm-hmm. And they don't want to hear from him. They um, they want nothing to do with any of that. They don't want um, I because this has been going on since I'm been fifteen. I have page upon pages of lists of medications I've tried, types of treatments I've tried, when I've tried them, who ordered them, did it work? Did it fail? Um, you know, all those different records and they won't take any of that either. Okay. Um, all right. I, I want to very calmly say to you guys, please immediately stop, start shopping, shopping for, uh, an alternative, a different attorney. Um, I, I want to point out as a general thing when it comes to this uh-huh. stuff that, um, some claimants, there's one impairment, right? The car accident, one impairment resulted. Some claimants, there's 10 impairments, right? And they have 15 medications. And it becomes what we call in law a totality of the circumstances situation. You are a totality of the circumstances situation. And for that reason, you have to be able to show how all these impairments, which is a good thing, limit your ability to do SGA, substantial gainful activity, work. And so long as you can do that, you'll get a vocational allowance. Now, because of your age, you know, I don't know how severe you are. So you might be a cow. You might be a listing, but I don't know. You know what a vocational allowance is? No. Okay, a vocational allowance. So there's five elements to disability law. The fourth and fifth element have to do with can you do your past work and can you do you know, other types of work in the national economy? And you don't have any past work, so we kind of skip right over element four. We go straight to element five, which is can you do other work in the national economy? And we start to think, okay, can she focus long enough? She Can she get along with people well enough? Can she lift things appropriate for the weight required for those jobs? Uh, can she do, you know, one to three simple uh, step, you know, base functions? Can she do three to five? Can she do five to whatever? We start to break it down as to each functional ability in the physical and the mental sense of what you can or cannot do. You know, can you start and finish things? Can you remember what you were working on? Can you handle uh, written instructions? Can you handle oral instructions? Can you handle things where, you know, somebody gets on you about something? And how do you handle when somebody blames you for something? They break it down into these little categories. And in your case, you're going to be off task a lot. You're not going to be focused. You couldn't do school. So, you know, I think the best evidence, my, my God, the best evidence with this claim is the dropping from one level to the next level to the next level to the next level of academia. To me, that, that is gold. That, that is a structured step down. That is what we call academia accommodations. That is in itself a form of an accommodation, right? Because you are accommodating yourself with simpler and simpler academia. So... Please go get the go get the school records. That's going to be the best evidence other than your medical evidence right there to show that you cannot do things because at each level you suffered to the point where you could not complete uh, the academia. Now, how long has it been since you've been in school? Um, I stopped going to school, I would say roughly eight years ago. Okay. And what have you been doing in those eight years? Um, I was working at a casino and a call center and for the last four and, a half, four and a half years or so I was an auto insurance agent before I became disabled January 2018 January but 2018 while, okay what happened January 2018 um, in the few months prior to that I was 
missing a huge amount of work um, from October to January. I was missing 90% of my shifts. Mm -hmm. So I took a medical leave of absence because I needed to have the surgery on my shoulder. Mm -hmm. And I, I just, I never recovered from it. Just, I've been getting worse and worse medically. Do you have the records from the company you used to work for that uh, show your absenteeism? Yes, I have uh, extensive pay stubs showing how many um, LWAP hours I had um, leave without pay. Plus, I have copies of all the accommodation that my company had provided for me. Um, a sit-stand desk, raised desk, as many breaks as I needed, an ergonomic chair. I mean, they did everything they could, and there would still be times that I was laying on the floor or had my head on my desk, and or I would be incoherent on the phone to where my supervisor would take over. A couple times I actually passed out, EMS had to come and get me. This is not a hard claim to win, but I can assure you, if you don't include that documentation, which is older than a year, you're going to make it a heck of a lot harder on yourself to win this claim. So um, it is of my professional opinion that you seek alternative counsel um, to go ahead and present the full totality of the circumstances aspect of this claim so that you have the opportunity to show the judge who's going to want to know where this all started. I mean, yeah. don't you think somebody reading this would like a, a beginning to the story as opposed to, and that's one of the things where you said to me, I became disabled on this date. Well, mm -hmm. did you? I mean, if you had that many absences, it sounds like you became disabled a couple of months before that, right? Sorry, I, so that's how the word has been referring to it because the last day I worked was January 30th, 2018. So, yeah, I work, came in, worked less than two hours and had to leave because of my pain, and I'd missed the week prior. Um, but that's how they've been referring to it is they're like, that's the day that you last day you worked, that's the day you became disabled. Didn't matter. I've, um, so. so another thing I would do is an uh, amended alleged onset date analysis to see what your total earnings were per month because I might push back and I know that's filed. I might push to try and get additional retroactive benefits, which are the months before the month you file. Those are the months you can claim before you file. And what those do is they kind of chip away at that first initial five months that don't count as part of back pay for SSDI benefits. So you want to eat those up with what's called retroactive benefits, where you go and uh, claim that you were impaired before that actual date. So did you have months where you did not work or worked very little and earned less than $1,300 uh, during that time period? Oh, definitely, yes. 2017, 2018, there were times my family had to help me. Plus the fact that I had purchased long-term disability through my job. And I actually missed so much work prior to January that they backdated the six-month waiting period on my long-term disability. Okay, so this is, not, this is not a hard claim to win. The thing that worries me a little bit about this is... <clears throat> the thing that worries me about this is some of the direction that's being given. Um, okay, and I can't ask you which judge you have because we're live on YouTube, so that is a little bit of an issue. Otherwise, I'd tell you specific questions and specific things that they're going to be looking at. Do you mind if I ask you a couple of trick questions, see how you do, and then tell you why they were trick questions? Go ahead. But, um, do you have any difficulty with, for example, cooking, cleaning, laundry, or paying bills? The cooking, cleaning, laundry, I don't really do. It's too painful. Um, paying the bills, I don't really have any. Most of my bills are auto debit. Okay. So one of the and things... Okay. One of the things I would look out for there is you said you can't do them, but what I'm looking for is why. So with cooking, I can't remember to close things. I can't remember to open things or start things. I don't finish what I start. I leave ovens on. Uh, I leave the oven on, I leave the refrigerator open, I can't lift heavy pots and pans, I can't follow instructions with recipes, laundry, I have a difficult time lifting the basket, I have to take article by article and put it into the machine, I have a difficult time lifting the soap in a gallon form, uh, cleaning, I can't push and pull a vacuum because it's too heavy, I can't lift up high or reach up high, 
uh, with cleaning supplies such as a duster. Details. Okay. okay. All right. Next trick question. Um, can you help me out with this? Um, do you have any pets? Um, yeah, my mom's got a cat. Okay. Sure. You, you help your mom out, right? You help your mom take care of the cat? I can't really. Um, I, if I try and refill the bowls or anything, I end up dropping them. Plus, I can't bend over. It hurts too much. Okay. How much do you think you could lift? Mm-hmm. On, on my right side, nothing. I will drop it, guaranteed, because I can't grasp things. On my left side, even a gallon of milk, a half gallon of milk is extremely painful for me. Okay. How much does a gallon of milk weigh by your estimation? One, uh, a couple pounds, maybe two or three pounds. I, I honestly don't know. Okay. Okay. So now don't take offense to this, but um, women, when it comes to the amount of weight that you know, how heavy something is and distance, Women tend to be really bad with that in hearings. You know, I'll ask a guy and they'll be like, oh, that's the weight of a, you know, of a paint can. That's, a, you know, they'll have a much better understanding of weights and distances. When you're thinking about answering something related to weights, know some basics of what things weigh. A gallon of milk is eight or nine pounds. A can of soup is around a pound. When you're talking about distances, think about a car. How many car distances would that be? And then know what that car is and how long that car actually is. So you can say in court, well, uh, you know, a Prius is about, let's just say 13 feet, and it's about five Prius lengths, like that. Yeah. Okay, cool. Okay. Next thing. Uh, um, uh, so, ma'am, tell me this. If you receive the benefits, how would you use them? I would basically use it just to continue getting my medical treatments. So you're saying oh, you don't currently you. have insurance? No, I do not. And when was the insurance cut off? May 2019. Some purposes. Okay, now what other benefits, and I'm assuming you're receiving food stamps, and other than food stamps, are you receiving on behalf of the federal, county, and state governments? No. Okay. All right, so here's the deal. Um, your voice sounds strained, which is excellent. I believe you're in pain. Um, when it comes to your situation... I think you and your mom are a good team. I think your mom adds the validity of the seriousness. And I think you add the validity of the reality of somebody who's really, really impaired. I think that would be a great comma to go in there. I would go ahead and submit a motion to the court that you are requesting the presence of a third party witness, which is mom. Your attorney will have all the phrasing and yada yada for that. A different attorney will have all the phrasing for that. I'd also uh, really like for you to go ahead and obtain the academia records, the letters, and um, if possible, um, uh, I, I know that we begin the conversation talking about uh, basically having to go all the way to a different state to get medical treatment. Um, Florida has a lot of specialists here, granted not all of them. With that said, they have enough for your particular impairments to go ahead and be found disabled. So I don't think that that is definitively uh, required to go ahead and win your, your, actually dis, your actual disability claim. Now, have you looked up what your judge's percent passage rate uh, actually is uh, in your area? Yeah, his um, acceptance rate is, I think, 34%. 30-something. It's 30-something percent in the low 30. All right. Now, do you know what that means? No. 47% is around the average. Something in the 30s is extremely low, which means you are really going to have to prove the heckaroo out of this claim in order to have a successful claim. So that means throwing the kitchen soup, bottle, sink, everything at this judge. You can really not withhold any uh, item in your war chest Otherwise, it's going to be a situation where you're going to be sitting there going, did we do enough? No, we didn't do enough. Um, okay. All right. Do you have any questions for me while I've got you on the phone before I switch over to somebody else to run questions? Um, there are two 
things. One, I did have a functional capacity evaluation done, a very extensive one. Mm -hmm. And he flat out said, even with a benevolent employer, I would not be able to maintain employment. And he has objective tests showing how diminished my right arm is, my ability to stand, walk, lift, grip, all of it. Um, and then I also had an independent medical exam done by a neurologist because a lot of my issues are back or nerve. Mm -hmm. And he concurred and he also said, there's no way she's going to be able to work ever. And um, that's something else the lawyers like, oh, they won't accept it. But I looked on social security's website and they do accept it. Do you think that plus my treating doctor is saying she can't work. She can't be around this, that, and the other thing, or do this, that, and the other thing. Well, it is enough to kind of tip. Let me tell you what will happen. If the judge finds out that your attorney purposely told you that the, that the judge will not accept a medical report known as an RFC, a residual functional capacity assessment, as to your abilities to do things. And then you have concurring agreement from a special a specialist, right? Not just a GP, but a specialist. The judge is going to ream out your attorney for not submitting that to the record. So um, I, I am flabbergasted. I'm not sure I have a word that is, you know, right for the, the just, I don't understand why your attorney would be doing that. It doesn't make sense to me. With that said, <clears throat> Some of these attorneys do some weird stuff. I don't know why they do it. I don't get it. It's just they somehow got it in their, you know, idea bag that, you know, this was okay. It's not okay. Uh, that should be submitted. Um, and that should be part of the brief and part of his opening statement. So uh, now if you look, you said when I heard it, it sounded like April 15th, but it's April 16th. So what day is the hearing again? Um, it's actually May. We had oh, okay. a voice conference meeting with the attorney yesterday, um, which is, is we're honestly getting conflicting information from the first attorney I was assigned, which was the son of the attorney that started practice. Right. And now I'm, I've been transferred to this one that's only been doing SSA for two months. And when we questioned it, the attorney that started the practice just screamed at us and called us liars and a whole bunch of other stuff. So Immediately request that attorney withdraw for fees and representation. Immediately. Okay. Um, um, you know. How do we find another attorney at this point? Because this one I'm at now was referred to me by an attorney I trust. I've since told him what happened and he's no longer recommending them, but I don't know where else to go at this point to find an attorney. The fastest way to find an attorney uh, that does, you know, a particular field of law that you might want would be to call the legal aid group of your county. They can usually give you an attorney that's been doing it for a while. Um, don't go by whatever is being advertised on TV. Just don't do it. It's all a trap that, 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 you know, they, they're paying to play and when you're seeing them advertise on television. That's why you see one law firm, another law firm, and another law firm advertising in a row because that main law firm that owns all those little law firms is basically paying for the entire block. Call your local county, um, call your local county uh, free legal aid and request to know who the chair of the social security disability uh, department is. Um, for Orange County, the one where I usually practice, it's Richard Culbertson. Uh, he was the guy that I interned with uh, way back in the day, like 10, 11, 12. I know Richard Schwartz was 13 years ago. It was a while ago, but God, we get we get old fast. We do. But um, the bottom line is uh, go ahead and call them. That should be uh, – uh, and there's another thing I want to point out. You do not just want an attorney. Uh, it's a state attorney. That's a no-no. You want a state and federal attorney. You want the attorney to be barred in a state and barred to also practice federal law. So, for example, like me, I can do federal district court law because I am registered to go ahead and do that as well. So check and see if they are registered to do district federal district law. Because let's say you get a denial at the ALJ here, you got to go to appeals council, then you got to get a remand, or then you got to go to the next level up because you get another denial, and then you're in federal district court. 
if you're in federal district court, okay, then you got to go to circuit court. Then you go to Supreme Court. Supreme Court as in like the big Supreme Court, the ones, you know, where you see the judges on TV, the big RGB, you know, the, the biggie. So make sure you're not just getting a state attorney, but also a state slash federal attorney. Okay. okay. I appreciate your time and that you do this. Absolutely. Us, uh, you know? Yeah. Thank you, guys. If you get a chance to click on to dis uh, Google and then uh, search disability resolution, if you could leave me five stars, I would super duper appreciate it.